Hello and welcome back to Get Fit Guy. This is Kevin. Last week, I received the following email from a lovely listener called Molly, who lives in Seattle. Dear Get Fit Guy, I'm an overweight, BMI 30, mum of two young children. After years of neglecting my physical and mental health, I decided to sign up for some organized runs this year that would force me to train and exercise. I followed a running plan and successfully completed a 5K in January, a 10K in March, a half marathon in June, another 10K in August. Then because a friend of mine asked me to, I signed up for an additional half marathon and completed it this month. While I'm proud of myself for accomplishing my goal, I'm now reading more about running training plans and apparently I'm too slow for any of this to count. In order to successfully sustain jogging 200 pounds for a full 13 miles, my pace is slow, like 15 minutes a mile slow. I'm reading from various online running authorities that running for three and a half hours, which is how long my first half marathon took me, has diminishing returns and is too hard on the body. My second half marathon, I shaved off nine minutes, ran it in three hours and 21, which is still shockingly long to my thinner or fitter friends. My recovery is about three to five days of soreness, then I'm back to lifting in short runs. So I ask you, should I focus more on my diet and progressively heavier lifting, which I am doing, and long walks, and stop trying to prove myself as a runner until I have less weight to carry around? Or is a half marathon a half marathon and I should just keep at it? Thank you for any advice. Well, hi Molly, thank you for the email. I've had to sit down and think about this. One might say I've used some philosophical thinking skills. So maybe, first of all, we're going to have a very super general run through some concepts from morality and value which you may want to consider. So when we come to think about what is good for us, there are many different schools of thought. But I would say that training and exercise, because there's something that we do for ourselves, they can be argued to fall into what's called hedonistic utilitarianism. That is, what's good for you is determined by the intensity, duration, and quality of the pleasure which it gives you. From your email, it seems that you enjoyed doing the training and completing the half marathon and other races you did. Training and performing for you doesn't seem to be about garnering praise from others, given that you noted how slow your times were compared to your friends. So I would say that if it's providing you with pleasure in terms of duration and intensity, then morally, you don't even need to consider the thoughts of others because the only good here is the consequence or outcome. Hedonistic utilitarianism is what we call consequentialism. Uh, and just bear in mind that, you know, any type of guru on the internet is there for their own consequence. Their greater good usually being more money and more fame. So it's normal and expected that They'll tell you you aren't fast enough, aren't strong enough, and probably the only solution is their program that they wrote for some famous athlete, and that program will now help you too. But honestly, who really cares? RPE, which most coaches refer to as rate of perceived exertion, I have my own interpretation of that acronym, which is rate of perceived excitement. And I've said this on the podcast before, if it's not fun, then you won't do it. And the greatest predictor of success is adherence. And the greatest predictor of adherence is enjoyment. Now, I did get an email from a listener the last time I said that, who I'll call Mr. Joy Boy, who said I was wrong and that pleasure has no role in anything in life. This person is clearly not a hedonistic consequentialist. That being said, I would say to you, we do have a lot of data regarding male and female differences when doing impact training in sports, such as running, as well as the role that body weight plays. So although I think that you can just enjoy the process, 
be kind to yourself and your amazing achievement of cutting nine minutes off your previous time. I do think there could be some training alternatives you might want to consider. I think that as a novice to this, there's still plenty of low-hanging fruit for you to pick. Novices can often go for a bike ride and see their bench press go up because there are physical benefits across the board to just getting fitter, irrespective of what modality you use. Eventually, this will stop, and what's called the SAID principle will apply, which is specific adaptation to imposed demand. This tells us that adaptations are task-specific. Right now, though, it may well be that you could increase your aerobic capacity, which will help with weight loss, if that's something you desire, as well as improving your ability to perform aerobic work such as running. So rowing, the ski erg machine, the upright bike, these are all great ways to improve aerobic capacity without having any impact to your body that running might have. At some point, yes, if you want to enter a running race, you have to run. But there's no reason you can't supplement some of this with less impactful cardio that you can later apply the gains in cardio to your running. All sports work this way. You have off seasons, right? Boxers don't do hard sparring all year. They do that just to prepare for the fight. The rest of the year, they do some skill work, they do some running, some strength work. So this should be no different for you. So maybe planning races out so that you have a race season might work for you. And then this way, you can spend the rest of the year building a broad base without having any impact. I do want to say that this question, though, is really complex and it doesn't have a one-size-fits-all answer. So whilst weight loss might benefit some people in terms of reducing risk or injury of enhancing performance, um, it's not a prerequisite for everyone. Factors such as body composition, your own personal goals, your training history and injury risk do all play roles in determining whether or not weight loss is necessary or beneficial. In particular, understanding the biomechanics of running, the impact of weight on joints, especially the knees, and how conditions like what we call knee valgus, which is where your knees kind of cave in towards the midline, and the angle of cue uh, affect injury risk. These things can help runners make decisions about preparation for longer runs. So what about the role of body weight in marathon training? So the general consensus in the running community is that a lighter body weight will enhance long distance running performance. In distance running, lower body weight translates to less energy expenditure and usually improved endurance. Um, and this is because running is a, a repetitive weight bearing activity. So each additional pound of weight that you carry requires more effort over the course of a race. According to a 2006 study in the Journal of Sports Science, Reducing body mass can improve running economy, which is the amount of oxygen which is consumed at any given pace. However, losing weight solely for performance reasons is not always necessary. Not all bodies are built the same way, and body weight is only one of many factors that contribute to success. Moreover, weight loss should be approached cautiously to ensure it doesn't lead to negative weight loss in terms of loss of muscle mass, which could also result in things like nutrient deficiencies and just a decrease in your overall health. If you listen to this podcast, you'll know I'm all about resisting aging. And one of the hallmarks of that is sarcopenia or loss of muscle mass. So if you're doing any weight loss for long distance cardio, you need to keep an eye on whether or not you're losing muscle mass. For heavier individuals as well, one concern it's often mentioned in relation to marathon running is the increased risk of injury to the knees. Running does place significant repetitive stress on your lower body and heavier individuals may experience greater force on their joints, which could increase the risk of overuse injuries. Now you'll notice there, I'm very specific about the language I'm using. I'm using words such as may and could, and that is because as to say that for sure something will happen in this situation is absolutely inductive thinking, which is where we just kind of multiply the conclusion out from the premises and we end up with an answer that's not necessarily reflective of the evidence that we have. But a 2012 study in the British Journal of Sports Medicine found 
that higher body weight was associated with increased risk of knee injury amongst runners. Um, this doesn't mean, though, like I said, that weight loss is a must for everyone. There's plenty of heavier runners that complete marathons and triathlons and all sorts without any injury. The key here might lie more in addressing biomechanical issues and improving the strength of the musculature surrounding the knees and following a training plan that means that you're slowly ramping up volume and intensity rather than just getting off the couch and trying to go out and smash out a huge run, you know? Um, next thing is just again to touch on the impact of body weight on your knees. The knee joint is particularly vulnerable in runners due to the amount of force it can absorb with every step. Research suggests that knees endure forces between 5 and 12 times of your body weight during each stride. So obviously the higher your body weight is, the, these forces get larger and larger. Over time, this can lead to joint pain or injury if not correctly managed through training volume, proper running form. It's even include things like proper running shoes here. So I'd recommend, you know, people get themselves out to a proper running shop that has a treadmill that you can get on and they're going to do a gait analysis for you and they can recommend a running shoe specific to your style um, rather than just, you know, going out to whatever store it is that you might like the look of their shoes. Now, one common injury amongst runners is called patellofemoral pain syndrome, um, also known as runner's knee, and that results from improper tracking of the kneecap over the femur. It's exacerbated by excess weight, which increases the load on the joint. But again, weight loss isn't always just a solution. Muscular imbalance fixes can help, improving the strength of your hip stabilizers or just changing running mechanics. The next one is knee valgus, which I mentioned earlier on, is when your knees are collapsing towards the midline uh, and the angle of Q. And this is something that does affect runners a lot. And it's a condition, like I said, the knees collapse inwards when running. You also see it when people are jumping and you can see it when people are coming up out the bottom of a squat. And this creates a kind of misalignment of the stress being placed across your knee joint. Uh, it's typically associated with weak glutes um, because these are responsible for stabilizing your hips and your pelvis. Um, and closely related to this is what we call the angle of Q. And that's the angle which is formed by the line of your quad muscles relative to your kneecap. And in females, because they have wider hips because of childbirth, really, this anatomical feature means that they have a much larger angle of Q. A larger angle of Q means more forces acting in a misaligned manner upon the knee. So that's what I'm saying is the differences between men and women and how body weight and forces across the joints act. Now, if you've got significant weight to lose, then yes, you can reduce the load on your knees and improve your efficiency by losing some weight. It can uh, reduce your knee valgus and other misalignments um, can help lower the, the risk of injury, especially when you combine this with strength training to help build the stabilizer muscles. But like I said, losing weight, but then not addressing any biomechanical issues doesn't eliminate injury risk anyway. You can lose weight, still have the same problems and then get injured. So uh, pros of, of weight loss, reduce joint stress as discussed, reducing body weight will help decrease impact on joints, especially the knees. Improved running economy, so lighter body weight improves efficiency, you're delivering more oxygen, and enhanced recovery. Lower body weight, again, it can help you to get um, reduced fatigue and soreness, and it speeds up recovery times. Cons of weight loss, well, if it's not done carefully, you can lose muscle mass, which is essential for running performance, injury prevention, and growing old gracefully. Strong muscular foundation supports all athleticism. You can have a nutrient deficiency because restrictive diets often cause those kind of things because people go out and eliminate entire food groups. You need to make sure you're maintaining a well-balanced diet and also just mental stress because pressure to lose weight and constantly getting on a weighing scale um, detracts from the enjoyment, right? It's not fun and it increases the risk that you'll just burn out from it because you're not enjoying yourself anymore. If you're going to commit to a sporting endeavor, you need a high degree of mental focus and this kind of thing can distract from that. So instead of focusing solely on weight loss, 
prioritize health, strength, and just make sure that your performance is improving a little bit every single time. Runners of all sizes succeed at marathons and other sports. Weight loss should not be viewed as a necessity for any type of training. So, yeah. There you have it. I don't think that losing weight before training for a marathon is a strict requirement. It can give you some benefits like reduced risk of joint stress and improved running economy. I also think sport, though, should be accessible to all and saying otherwise is tantamount to body shaming. For heavier individuals or those prone to joint issues, sharing a few pounds might help lower injury risk but should not be pursued at the expense of muscular strength, nutrition, or your mental well-being. More important factors such as knee valgus, angle of cue, and your biomechanical efficiency should be addressed regardless of your body weight. A runner's success in marathon and other trainings is not determined by the number on the scale, but commitment to consistent training, injury prevention, and having a holistic approach to health and performance. Whether or not weight loss is part of your marathon preparation, long-term health and fitness will set you up for success. If you have any questions, just want to say hi, you know what to do. Email me, getfitguy at quickanddirtytips.com. Get Fit Guy is a Quick and Dirty Tips podcast. Thank you to Morgan Christensen, Holly Hutchins, Brennan Getches, Davina Tomlin, and me, Kevin Dunn. If you have a question, 510-353-3104 or email getfitguy at quickanddirtytips.com. More information, visit quickanddirtytips.com or check out the show notes in the podcast app.